I recently read that the average person loses about 800 socks in a lifetime, some 10 socks a year. Now, according to my husband, that is a ridiculously low, no, low number, and I can attest without reservation that he is above average. Where socks end up and how they get there is another matter entirely, along with the question of just what one does with a single sock. Just as we can't always figure out the way to re reunite a sock with its warm, secure place in the draw, sometimes we have a similar problem ourselves. We're not quite sure how to repair our souls or decide exactly where we want to be or need to be. And the way back isn't always obvious. At this time of year, we know where our place is, but getting there isn't as simple as putting on our shoes and socks and setting out. There are always obstacles. What keeps us from finding our way back home, to temple, to God, and to our best self? A journey starts with a single step, with or without socks. And even if you live nearby, we know that getting here can be a challenge. That has nothing to do with what I call the wedding rule, that those who live closest are always the latest to arrive. Instead, it's the spiritual challenge to bring ourselves to the day. Teshuva is the journey home. The word shares a linguistic foundation with turning, returning, repentance. And while it's meant to be a process which takes place over time, beginning as early as a month before Rosh Hashanah, as with so many things that are difficult, Teshuva is just as often compressed into a single day. The pervasive attitude, we're here now, let's get this done, reflects that. But for a process that requires planning and participation and effort, results vary. And the emphasis on perfect repentance, an expression which threads through our prayer book, carries with it the pressure of a perfect test score, a tall order, is there anyone who measures up to that? In a season of expectations, being judged is never comfortable. And as we all know, our greatest critics live within us. The irony is that we test ourselves. Rabbi Lawrence Hoffman, the great liturgist and scholar, points out a different kind of pitfall though he saw it through the lens of the Seder. There he notes that while we may begin with the message of the holiday, we tend to expand upon it so much that it can be paralyzing, and it may keep us from putting our words into effect. For so many people, the high holidays feel just like that. They are met by overwhelming expectations which they feel they cannot manage in the time they have allotted. But the task isn't all or nothing because one step leads to the next. And if we can repair a relationship or begin to identify where we need to change, then what follows will be easier. The rabbis tell of a king who in a fit of anger sent his son away from his kingdom to live in a foreign land. Years passed and the anger subsided. The king sent a messenger to his son saying that he longed for his estranged son to return. The son sent the messenger back to his father explaining the hurt remained. The distance was too great. He could not or would not make the journey. The king received the message and sent back the following reply. 
Return as far as you can, and I will meet you the rest of the way. You have already taken the first step. And so it is with Shul. By pairing your day with the synagogue, you can find both warmth and comfort here, if for no other reason than it's your spiritual home, your Jewish home. On many Sabbaths, on days when it's not necessary to take an assigned seat, so many return to the place where they are sitting now. It's your spiritual address, a place where you can be reached when God seeks you. And even new members can feel as if they are coming home to the experience at Sinai. The brilliance of tradition is that each year we arrive. Coming home to God is not unlike coming home to family. There's a lot to be said about family and dynamics during the holidays. For some, it's a blessing, and for others, not so much. Can be complicated. Remember when you were newly on your own and your parents urged you to visit, but being busy with your own life, being away from home was the whole point, and so we made that trip infrequently. As we age, homecoming has greater resonance as we feel the years pass ever more quickly. For many, home at its most nostalgic is the place where we can be our most authentic self. At its threshold, we leave behind the trappings of work, the titles, the concern for what others think about us, the need to impress, to dazzle, to perform. Underneath what we show the world, at home we wear our inner self on the outside without apology or concern. We can't help ourselves. So too our parents know us for who we are. They remember when, too. From the joy that accompanied our arrival, the baby steps and first words, to the challenging times of tradition and transition and growth, reaching for independence. And they also remember when, after our endless searching for the right words to convey to them a recently discovered precious gem of self-knowledge, they soothed us, saying, I knew that all along. It's just who you are, just as God knows us even before we speak. In so many ways, we don't need to explain ourselves to God any more than we need to do so for our own parents, our own family. It's just that today we should, not for God's sake, but for our own, so we clearly understand where we've been and can be deliberate in mapping the next leg of the journey. Avinu Malkenu, we say, and God is both like a parent and at other times like a sovereign ruler. Sometimes like a parent, God partners with us and we are able to feel both comforted and guided through our challenges and joys. At other times, God is sovereign. More than once, parents have told a child I don't want to do this, but I must. Today, our work, Teshuvah, returning, is to help God move from that throne of justice to one of mercy. As God's representatives on earth, at our parents' table, we learn the most important of all life's lessons. It's less about what one eats than what happens there. It's a place where values are shared, examined, and challenged, 
a forum for difficult conversations which are softened through loving relationships. More than manners, at the kitchen table we are taught how to care for one another, to listen, to support, to question, and more importantly, to accept and repair relationships. The idealized image is dissipated, of course, when we recall that the same table invited other interactions. Sometimes there were angry words and tears caused by misunderstandings, which cannot be retrieved but are never left to rest. So too coming home invites childhood rivalries and labels even now. That's how powerful the imprint of family remains. No one wants to be reminded of their failure, but Yom Kippur gives us the means to deal with it. Pain endures only as long as we fail to acknowledge our own responsibility. But if we've changed our behavior, if we can forgive ourselves, then what others have to say about us no longer matters quite as much. The urge to return to Shuva is very deep inside, just as leaving home pushes us to grow in countless ways. Returning shows us how much we have changed. On this day, we are encouraged to come home to ourselves, to the part that we keep deeply hidden, even from ourselves. Almost every visit home includes a nostalgic survey of our younger years, represented by the childhood things that once mattered so much, report cards and letters, the baseball and Barbie collections, trophies and awards once proudly displayed but have now been relegated to a less prominent place. But our spiritual life is not so neat. There's no attic with our treasures, no draw with our merit badges and scorecards. The only way we can unpack and sort through everything we've left behind this year is to look through the layers one by one. Rabbi David Wolpe teaches, repentance is an ongoing process because no one moves flawlessly through the world. Even at this hour, Despite the bright boundary line for repentance that Yom Kippur draws, there are things that we did not get to check off our list, people we meant to call, and things we failed to face, maybe because we thought we could put it off again. When we say I'll hate as a community, it functions not only as a confession, but as an organizer. For the sins we have committed by stress or through choice, by disrespect, by evil meditations of the heart, by abuse of power. With a spiritual checklist, it's easier to remember what we have done and what has been left undone. Our work then really starts now, after Yom Kippur, now that we have clearly identified all the dark places and accepted the fact that there are still amends to be made. Teshuvah tells us that we can turn, return, repent at any time we need not wait only for Yom Kippur. Tomorrow and every day thereafter, we can work on what we have learned about ourselves here, today, now. Every day can be a mini Yom Kippur because when tradition takes the measure of us, we are seen through our behavior and deeds. 
by how we act in the face of challenging circumstances. This year, let us pair ourselves more closely to the things that matter to us. We can come home. On Yom Kippur, there is no truer statement than God is waiting for us to come home. Rachel Barenblatt, a poet and rabbi, helps us envision God as a parent waiting for her beloved children with all their flaws to come home to her embracing love. Here is an excerpt. God sits in her kitchen with her gnarled hands folded. She doesn't needlepoint much anymore. She's waiting for us to knock. We always forget the door is always open. God remembers when each of us was born. God remembers when creation was born. God remembers every child she has lost. God remembers every time one of us has been unkind. Each night she lights memorial candles across the heavens our souls remembered across the sky. God wants to say, it's okay that you didn't write. It's okay that you didn't call. You stayed away because you didn't want to disappoint me. You could never disappoint me. Do you know I still love you? How often do we sit here in shul reciting prayers we didn't write? signing postcards and dropping them in the mailbox instead of coming home. God is waiting for us to come home. The door is always open. Gamar Hatimatova, may you be sealed into the book of life with blessings.